Hello everyone, welcome to week 14. Um, for the rest of this course we're going to be talking about landscapes, most of which are formed by some aspect of the water cycle. So for today I'm going to introduce the water cycle and how one portion of the water cycle, which are streams, um, influence and change the landscapes that we see around us. Uh, for the rest of this quarter we're going to go through, excuse me, this semester we're going to go through streams, um, floods, deserts, coastlines, glaciers, and learn about how all of these aspects influence the geology around us and influence uh, what we see in our landscapes. So for today, we are going to start with streams. We're going to learn about streams and drainage networks. We will learn about erosion and deposition and how it differs in different parts of the stream. Um, we're going to learn about the changes that occur down the length of the stream from the headlands to the mouth. Also, we're going to uh, understand what we mean by discharge of a stream, so calculating uh, stream discharge. And then we'll go over uh, meandering streams and how they change with time. And we'll go over a few uh, environmental aspects of streams. We won't get too much into flooding. We'll mention it a little bit. Um, but part two of this week's lab is all about flooding. So I'll save most of it for the next lecture in the next lab. So here is a figure of the water cycle, very simplified one, but just to refresh your memory, water moves uh, throughout the Earth's system. It falls from the atmosphere as rain, precipitation, down to the surface. That rain can run off, run off the surface. It can sink down into uh, groundwater, into the storage of water we have underground, or it can run off into streams and rivers and lakes and then into oceans. Uh, the water is then uh, eventually evaporated again back into the atmosphere. It creates this cycle. Here's a little bit more of a detailed figure. Um, essentially, the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, is just the cycling of water from the ocean to the land, to the atmosphere, to the ocean, and, and back again. Um, it's all driven by the heat from the sun. So we are going to focus on this little aspect of the figure, streams and uh, stream flow today. So a stream is water that is running through a channel. So a channel being uh, the path of the stream. So the water moves from the headlands, which is where we call kind of the top, um, where the water uh, originates, down to the mouth of the stream. So the bottom of the stream, where that stream hits uh, it's sort of where the stream ends, which means when it hits another body of water, for example, the ocean. Um, the banks of the stream are the edges or the sides of the stream during its average uh, water flow. When there's more water than normal and the water spills up over the banks of the stream, that's what we call a flood. That's what we will get into um, in the second part of this week. So streams are formed because water falls from the sky. Water also melts from ice. So here we have in this picture, it's raining, but also we have um, some glacier here that is melting. So there's an accumulation of water. We are adding water to this environment. Some of that water is going to infiltrate down into the groundwater, um, into the water table that's beneath, but not all of it will. So some of the water will actually run off the surface, which is how we create streams. So when water is flowing down a hill and it flows along the surface of the earth, instead of sinking down into uh, the water table, we have a stream. So a stream channel, the channel, the actual path that the stream is flowing in, um, it's created by erosion on the surface, but something like uneven erosion. So it's uneven because that certain spot where the stream ends up is eroded more than the land around it. So it is um, deeper cut, allowing for water to fill that area because water always wants to go to the shallowest area, to the area that is closest to sea level. So the water is going to accumulate where the um, surface is unevenly eroded. So there's a couple different types of drainage networks that you might see. We're not going to get too much into them, but I want to show these examples from the textbook. So a dendritic 
Um, Drainage Network is something uh, probably the most recognizable if you're thinking about rivers in the U.S. For example, Mississippi, where you have uh, multiple streams and all combining into one. So it sort of looks like a root system. You have one main stream here that would continue down out of this figure. All of these smaller streams contribute to that one thing. Um, radial streams is where you have something like it would be a volcano or a mountain and water streams off of the mountain in all directions. So it goes outwards in a circle. Like uh, That's why it's called radial. Um, rectangular is where you have a highly jointed surface. So you already have these joints and these cracks. So the water just fills in where those joints already existed. Um, trellis, this looks like a trellis that you might have in your garden. Um, that would be where you have different types of um, rock layers eroding in different ways. So you'll notice this um, syncline here. We have a syncline and then an anticline if you're looking at uh, the cross section on the side. So this um, grayer layer is harder to erode. That's why it is still um, here making these mountains, whereas this barely existing now beige layer was much easier to erode. So because of this folding, you end up with this really cool um, pattern of horizontal uh, rock layers sticking up from the surface. Um, this is called a trellis. This would be not something I would expect you to pick out and actually see from a real image because they can be pretty difficult um, to point to pick out, but they are pretty cool. Um, and then parallel, this would be uh, if water is running off of, say, a mountainside or a mountain range where uh, these valleys already existed. So the valleys in between uh, the pieces of mountain, let's say at a continental collision location, if these valleys already existed, um, the water would accumulate there and it would end up looking like uh, very parallel lines instead of something dendritic where um, all of the streams meet up into one. So when we talk about uh, drainage we really want to focus on drainage basins. So a drainage basin it can also be called a catchment or a river basin um, or a watershed. So this is where uh, there is a stream here flowing down the middle and all of the water that is in this stream is falls somewhere within this drainage basin. So all of the water that falls in this whole entire drainage basin all drains into the same stream. So it might run down uh, the side of these mountains in all different places, but at the bottom of the drainage basin, all of the water that fell here is going to be uh, collected into the same stream. So it's the area drained, drainage basin, um, by a single stream. So here you can see uh, two different drainage basins. So this would be uh, stream A right here. Here we have stream B, as this is labeled. So all of the water that falls on this side here is going to drain eventually into stream A, whereas all of the water that falls on this side here is going to drain into uh, stream B. And in between, we have the drainage divide. So the drainage divide, it's usually a ridge line, um, is what divides the two drainage basins. So we have um, two different types of streams when we think of uh, seasonality. Permanent streams are where water is flowing all year long, so it is constantly a stream. The water level might change throughout the year, but there's always water in the stream. This is probably an area that has a good amount of rainfall and um, a high water table, so a lot of uh, groundwater and very low rates of evaporation. So to have a stream flowing all year, you have to have water all year. The opposite would be a seasonal stream. Um, this is a stream that does not flow all year. It only would flow in the wet season. So this would be an area with low rainfall, very low water table. Um, we're going to talk about groundwater and water table next week, I believe. So don't worry um, too much 
about groundwater in the water table, it might come up, but we're going to get into it with a whole lab on groundwater. Um, and this location, it's going to be something more desert-like than the other, where the sustained water in the stream cannot last all year long. So when we think about the amount of water in the stream, we think about discharge. So stream discharge, it is the amount of water flowing through the stream, and it is essentially the width of the stream, so across times the depth, and then the speed of the water, so the velocity of the water. So really we're looking at the size of the drainage basin and also the climate. So how big is the drainage basin and how much water falls? That is pretty much summed up by the value of the stream discharge. Um, stream discharge also is always Q. So if you were looking at a stream like this, and I were to ask you, where is the stream flowing the fastest? I can't ask you because we are not in class. But what you'd want to think about is the friction of the water along the sides of the stream. So the slowest area, the slowest region, would be all along the sides of the stream where there is a lot of friction interacting with the water, slowing the water down. So the fastest spot in the stream would actually be the spot that is furthest away from all of the edges, which would be A here. So here we have the highest stream velocity, the water is flowing the fastest, here we have much, much slower because um, the energy is lost due to the friction. So then you can do something similar if you look at two different streams that have the same volumes, so the same amount of water. This one is deeper, this one is shallower, but it's more spread out, so it's the same amount of water. But which stream would flow the fastest? Again, you would think about friction. So this stream, there is a large amount of water that is in contact with the, uh, with the ground beneath the, the floor of the stream. So you would expect B to be flowing a lot slower. Uh, stream A would flow a lot faster because there's water that is further away from the edges, further away from the friction slowing down. So A would be a stream that is the shape of a stream that is flowing faster than B in this example. Um, when water is flowing through a stream, it's not perfectly straight. So it's not flowing smoothly. There are a lot of different um, twists and swirls and what we call this is turbulence. So it's the same as when you're in an airplane and you experience turbulence. That's because the atmosphere, the air you're flying through, it probably looks something like this. Um, it happens in water also. So when water goes over um, rocks, when water is up against the edge, um, there's lots of different effects. We're not going to get into the um, physics of uh, water motion at all, but just so you know, there's a lot going on as water flows down the channel because the channel is never a smooth um, a smooth surface on the bottom or the sides, Un unless it's man-made, then it might be. Um, so water falls, it hits, it flows, I should say, into the stream and the river. And then what happens as water is flowing down through the river, down through the stream channel, is um, you're going to have a lot of erosion. So erosion is very, very common where there are streams, specifically when we have floods. So streams can be really damaging. Um, during flooding, it is the worst because we have highest um, speeds. So the water will be moving the fastest. There will also be extra water. So when we have a flood, remember that's when there's um, high water levels. So there's uh, too much water. And then generally in a flood, you also have sediment in the water because the water is able to move faster. It's going to pick up a lot more um, sediment. So it'll be carrying, not only will there be a lot of it and it will be moving faster, but it will be carrying sediment, which could be um, large rocks. It's not just um, clay-sized particles, for example. So uh, the energy of erosion comes just from gravity. So as water is flowing downhill, if you have more of it, it's heavy, it's going to be um, pulled faster downhill. So there's 
different types of erosion that's experienced as water is running along the um, stream channels or the banks of the stream, say if it's a flood. Um, scouring is when loose sediments and loose rocks are picked up and transported away. Uh, we can have breaking and lifting, whereas larger rocks are broken and then moved. So solid pieces of rock are actually like split into multiple pieces and then moved downstream. Um, abrasion is where uh, sediment in the water. So if you have sediment within your water, it can act like sandpaper and it can actually rub against the sides of the stream and the bottom of the stream, adding more sediment to the water. And then uh, dissolution as well, which I know we've talked about with uh, mineral forming, but dissolution is where the water will actually dissolve minerals of the rock and the sediment away and carry those minerals downstream. So the erosion, the amount of the erosion and the intensity of the erosion um, really depends on the velocity of the water and the amount of water that is moving. So when we talk about the amount of water, we can think about uh, capacity. So the capacity of a stream is the amount of sediment that can be transported by that stream. So how much stuff can actually be transported by that stream? It's controlled by the amount of water that's there. So controlled by um, the stream discharge. The competence, however, of a stream is the size, well, it's the maximum size of the sediments that can be transported. So that is controlled by the velocity. So if you can imagine um, a stream that could pick up pieces of gravel must be moving a lot faster than a stream that is picking up pieces of clay. So in order for uh, larger pieces of sediment like gravel or even small stones to be transported down a stream, the stream must be moving very fast or much faster than say a stream that can pick up pieces of sand or pieces of silt. So the larger the sediment, um, the faster the stream must be moving in order to carry it. So that is called competence. So the faster the stream, the larger the sediment that can actually be transported down that stream, competence. So when we think about um, these two things, capacity and competence, really we're thinking about the load that the stream can carry. So we have what we call the bed load, which is uh, the sediment that is along the bottom of the stream. So it is stays on the bottom, but it is transported downstream with the water by just um, rolling, shifting, sliding, bouncing, but it stays on the bottom. So this, these sediments are not actually picked up. They might be uh, just a little bit, but um, they're not actually picked up and placed somewhere else. They're really just rolling and bumping along the bottom. That's the bed load. Um, the suspended load. Suspended load is... Um, the pieces that are small enough to actually be suspended in the water. So they're floating in the water, floating downstream. They don't touch the bottom. So the stream is moving fast enough to actually pick up some of these small pieces and they stay floating in the water, floating downstream. The dissolved load, this is where the dissolution comes in. Dissolved load is what is actually dissolved into the water so you can't see it. Um, it is like fully dissolved into the water and being transported downstream. So the difference in these three is, of course, the size of the particles. Uh, maybe not the dissolved load. That might have to do with the, the chemistry. Um, but between the bed load and the suspended load, you'd expect the bed load um, to be much larger than the suspended load. So now that these uh, particles are, we know how they are. Uh, lift it up. We know how they can then be moved. Um, how are they dropped? So sediment deposition is when uh, the speed of the stream actually slows so that the sediment being carried can drop. So as your velocity decreases, so does your competence. So remember the competence um, 
is dependent on velocity. So if your stream is going very fast, it can pick up large pieces of sediment. And then as the stream slows down, it can no longer carry those large pieces of sediment. So if the stream slows, maybe now it can only um, carry the sand, silt, and the clay. All the gravel is actually going to drop out. So the stream is going to deposit all of that gravel as the stream slows down. So as your stream is slowing, you're going to have the largest pieces or the, the coarsest, the heaviest sediments settling out first. The smallest and the lightest sediments are going to settle out very, uh, very last, um, often only in still water. So where you have an abundance of um, clay, you would expect that clay to have settled out of still water. So you know that there is, um, there was at one time uh, stagnant water there, slow, uh, slow enough for the clay to actually settle out to the bottom, actually fall to the bottom out of the water. So when we think about streams slowing down and depositing, uh, we think about the gradient. So I know we've talked about gradient many times. This is very similar. Um, here we're talking about a stream longitudinal profile. So how does the stream change with distance from the headwaters at the top to the mouth, which would be somewhere down here off the edge of the picture. So generally, um, we say that the, the gradient or the slope is going to look like a concave up curve, something like this here, where we have um, stronger erosion, uh, excuse me, stronger slope, um, up at the top, steeper slope, which gets shallower and shallower um, until the uh, surface is almost parallel um, to the ocean. So we get from the headwaters down to the sea level. We're going to have a decrease in that slope as we get furthest from the headwaters. And really that's just because there, over time, will be a lot of erosion at the top. We have um, high erosion, high erosion, high erosion, and then as the stream slows, we're going to start to deposit. So here we will start um, depositing all of the sediment that was once carried to the point where um, the ground is parallel to sea level. So really the stream longitudinal profile is sort of a balance between the erosion up at the headwaters and uh, deposition at the mouth. So here's another picture. We have the headwaters here where the water is accumulating. This would be a dendritic um, basin. You can see that all of the water is flowing into this same stream. Gets down uh, closer to sea level. Here we have a braided stream. Here we have some meanders. I'm gonna talk about both of those at the end. Um, we reach a delta. And here's the mouth where the water um, hits the ocean. So here, we would expect to have a lot of deposition. So up here where it looks like the um, slope is steeper, we would expect erosion. This is probably moving faster. This water is carrying sediment. As it gets closer to sea level is when it's going to start to deposit because the speed slows down. So the reason for that is because water wants to reach what we call the ultimate base level. So the ultimate base level of a stream is sea level. So water, because of gravity, wants to reach the ultimate base level. So water is going to flow from um, up higher down to the ultimate base level, which is sea level. Um, you would never have a stream below ultimate base level. Otherwise, you would have something deeper, which means the water would actually flow from the ocean into the stream. We have streams that flow into the ocean. So streams are always trying to reach what we call the ultimate base level. So that water will eventually, unless it's evaporated along the way, it will flow all the way down to sea level, down to the ocean. So as the water is flowing, um, let's go over a couple of the landscapes that are formed. So we have valleys and canyons can be formed by uh, rivers and streams. So water forms what we call a V-shaped valley, aptly named, because as you can see, 
this makes a nice V shape. So this is a V-shaped valley. Um, when we get into glaciers, uh, you'll see that glaciers form a U-shaped valley. That's what we call them. Uh, V-shaped to be clear that this was formed by water. Um, this happens when rivers are high above that ultimate base level. So they are, this would not happen right near sea level. This you would expect somewhere in the mountains um, because there's high energy. The water is uh, has a lot of energy as it's, moving from the headwaters down towards the mouth. Um, this is just due to erosion as the water is flowing. So this V shape is formed by um, erosion as the water is flowing. There will be a lot of mass wasting events uh, over time. Landslide and rock falls, uh, we form this V shaped valley. Um, we call it a valley when the slopes are gentle. A canyon is where you have um, almost vertical steep slopes. So here I have, yes, so here is a picture of a canyon. This is a slot canyon. Um, you'll notice the walls are almost vertical compared to here where they're clearly in a V shape. Um, that just has to do with the strength of the rock that you're flowing through. So if it's really, really strong rock, um, you are going to form a canyon because there will be um, down cutting. There's not going to be much um, side falling. So you're, you're really just going to cut straight down. Whereas if you have softer rock, as the water is flowing, you would expect to have more mass wasting events. So as your water flows, you're going to have more and more of your rock on the side actually falling um, into your valley, into your river, into your stream. The stream will carry away the debris. Um, but softer rock that falls apart more easily is what's going to create a V shape. If you have um, stronger, harder rock, you will create a uh, canyon. So valleys and canyons, um, when we have different layers, so we know that strata come in layers, they can be layers of different hardness. We can get a um, landscape like this, and you can actually tell which layers are harder and softer. So again, the really hard layers of rock are what's going to create canyon walls. And the soft layers of rock are what will create valley walls. So you can look at a um, photo like this, and you can say here must be very hard rock. Here must be very hard rock. Down here is very hard rock where we have those vertical sides, almost cliff sides. Whereas when we have the, um, the valley walls, this or this here or this part here, those layers of rock must be softer because they produce that sloped wall instead of just the, the vertical cliff. So this is uh, really cool if you go to the Grand Canyon, you can look at... Um, what we call uh, the steps of the stairs. So the stair steps, we call them stair step canyons when there's different um, hardnesses of rock on top of each other and you can clearly see it like this. It creates sort of a, a staircase. So another landscape formed by streams, of course, are waterfalls. So waterfalls are when uh, streams and rivers are in free fall. So they're falling over a step. Um, as it falls, there's a lot of energy when the water eventually does hit the ground. So it creates what we call, uh, here we go, a plunge pool. So the plunge pool is here. Here we have our water. It is flowing downwards. It's hitting this plunge pool. So there's going to be a lot of erosion, not only along the edge as the water is falling, but down into the very, um, the base of the waterfall. And what happens is um, we have pretty constant undercutting. So here, as the water is falling over the top of the uh, waterfall, we're going to have erosion all along these layers of rock. We will also have undercutting due to this plunge pool. So what happens in a waterfall is the position of the waterfall actually moves through time because of this erosion. So we'll actually, for example, um, this one here, this outlines the position in 1900, and then uh, 50 years later, it shows you how this waterfall is actually moving backwards because of the erosion that it's causing. So, for example, Niagara Falls um, is 
continuously being eroded. It is eroding over and over and over again. All the time eroding and moving further backwards. So another feature that I mentioned are braided streams. So this is what it would look like from above. So this you would expect at the base of really steep gradients. So where a really steep gradient ends, where um, something that was very steep uh, flattens out, you're going to have a huge amount of sediment deposited. So as you can imagine here, it's very uh, muddy, it's silty. You wouldn't really wanna walk through here. It'd be really difficult to walk. Your feet would get stuck. Um, that's because this is where the velocity of the stream is going to drastically drop. So it was a steep gradient that ends or that slows a lot. Um, all of that sediment is going to drop here and the water does not have one specific channel. So it's sort of a, a large water channel that isn't always full. So there's so much sediment and all of the sediment is very loose sediment that the waterway can actually change. So uh, one day all of the water is flowing this way um, along where my highlighter is or my pointer is. However, uh, later in the day you might find that this stream deposits a large amount of clay and silt right here, so the water will actually switch directions. So it ends up looking like the braid, a braid in, in a hair. Um, you have sort of switching over this whole region because there's so much unconsolidated sediment, um, the water just moves around the sediment. Here's another example. Um, so this is not necessarily clay, it's more uh, larger rocks maybe gravel, that's what I would say. Um, but as the water flows downwards, notice this was a very steep gradient, hit the bottom, now we have this uh, braided stream. The water is going to flow around and through this unconsolidated sediment, but it's not necessarily one channel because as the water moves, it's going to move the sediment around. So uh, my favorite part of streams are looking at uh, meandering streams. So meandering streams occur when the stream reaches base level or very, very close to base level, meaning very close to um, sea level. So the erosional forces downward that would create a valley or a channel are much less and the erosion actually picks up um, side to side or lateral. This is what creates meandering streams, is a lateral erosion. So side to side instead of um, up and down. So a meandering stream is something like this where there are big loops. So up in the, up in the mountains you would have your water flowing down through your valley. Here's your dendritic basin all flowing into the stream. Um, as we get, so let's say this is up in the mountains, this is down by the uh, sea level, or at least by the base level. You have your uh, floodplain, so really these are your channels, uh, sorry, these are your uh, the edges of your channel. So this is your whole stream channel here, there's not quite enough water to fill it in. Um, we end up with a meandering stream where the water will actually erode more side to side, side to side as it's flowing, rather than eroding um, straight downwards. So here, um, how a meandering stream erodes side to side is that the fastest speed is going to be on, on the outside edge. So as the speed, so this arrow is showing the fastest speed. So as the fastest speed along the outside edge of that curve, um, as that increases, we're going to have high erosion on the outside curve. Same with down here, we're going to have high erosion on the outside of the curve. On the inside of the curve, we have the slowest speeds, so the slowest water speed. So we'll actually have deposition on the inside of the curve and dep deposition on the inside of the curve here. So over time, these meanders or these curves become more and more and more pronounced because here there's erosion, remember on the outside of this curve, 
that's going to continue eroding, 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 eroding. We're also going to have deposition on the inside. So on the inside of this curve is where the water is moving slowest. We have deposition. So it actually shifts the river. It shifts the stream towards that um, outside of the curve. The same thing's happening on this side here. And what eventually happens is it becomes um, so extreme and so pronounced that these two will join back together again. So these two pieces of the stream will get so close together due to the erosion here, the erosion here, and the erosion here, that it's actually going to join back together and create what we call an oxbow lake. So this uh, a meander will actually be cut off and it will be create what is called an oxbow lake. So I have, yeah, more pictures. Um, in that here we can see the water is flowing. We have the outside curve where we have erosion. Here is the inside curve. Water is moving slower. There's deposition. Here again, the inside curve of deposition, outside curve of erosion. So we have um, these meanders, these curves getting more and more and more extreme through time until they cut off creating that oxbow lake. So here's a picture. Um, so the cut bank being this part, um, where you have the fastest flow, you're going to have the most erosion. So this is um, a house in January 1965. Uh, these were in your textbook. So 1965 January, and then here's the stream, of course, flowing right next to this house. And then we have March of 1965. So hope they had good insurance. This is uh, not a place you would want to build your house next to a stream that is meandering because it can be uh, pretty extreme changes. So here's a picture from above. I like this one. I think this is from our textbook as well. So you can see the meanders um, as the stream is flowing. Here we can see this meander is getting uh, pretty closed off. That will... Um, cut off and become an oxbow lake pretty soon. So here is an old meander that used to exist, but um, it got so close together that the uh, stream rejoined itself, cut off that oxbow lake there. You can see all of these different oxbow lakes hanging off the sides. And here are more pictures of what the oxbow lake actually looks like. So here you can see the lake you can also see, I like this picture, because you can see that the water is um, all on the outside curve of that uh, meander. So the water is actually flowing on the outside curve, and you have deposition of all this sand. So the really light, almost bright looking material, that is the sand that's being deposited. So down here you can see it better. Um, here is sand that's being deposited on the inside of the curve, where you have water all along um, all the way up to the bank on the outside of the curve because we know that is eroding away the side of that river bank. So um, before we start talking all about floods in the later part of this week, um, I want to show you how floodplains are actually created. So a stream, here we have our meandering stream going all through what we call the floodplain. So a floodplain is the area that can be and has in the past been flooded. So you can see that generally by uh, where is the stream and where are the banks of the stream. So the wide banks of the stream show that this whole area has been flooded and can be flooded when there's too much water. Another feature that's really common is an alluvial fan. So this is where we have water uh, bringing sediment down the side of a mountain. So all of the sediment that is being carried from all of the water flowing down this stream, down the side of a mountain, when it hits a flat surface, all of a sudden the velocity of the stream is going to de decrease drastically and all that material is going to be dropped. So you'll see these all over if you're driving in the mountains. Um, in California, we have them all over the place where you see all of the water that was flowing down the side of the mountain, it hit the ground, the flat ground, deposited all of its sediment because it started flowing so slowly. So not the best place for a road. 
because this is just going to continue happening as sediment is carried down the mountain. The sediment is going to be dropped here and spread out in what looks like a fan. That's why we call it an alluvial fan um, as the water slows down at the base of the mountain. Uh, so the last feature, whoops, um, the last feature to talk about are deltas. So deltas are also formed by steam stream deposition. It's really similar to alluvial fans, but instead of hitting flat ground, you're hitting a body of water. So the river um, will flow when it hits something that's moving slower than it is, being the ocean. Generally, this happens in the ocean. Um, that river is going to deposit all of its sediment. So the river might have been flowing, able to carry some sediment. It had a good amount of speed. When it hits the slow moving ocean or bay that this is, it's going to deposit all of the sediment as it flows slowly now into the larger body of water. So the delta accumulates sediment as the stream flows and continues to drop sediment because it will always slow down as it hits that um, uh, as it hits that slower moving body of water. So we call the delta or the delta plain um, the sediment that has accumulated at the mouth of the river. So where the river meets the body of water, generally it's the ocean, that is called the delta. So where all of that sediment accumulates. So for big rivers, it ends up being um, a huge amount of sediment. And actually sometimes there are roads and things built on um, the delta.